trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i'm your humble host coach jason coop and today's podcast is on a subject that i find is one of the most problematic impactful and confusing areas when working with athletes and that is iron status and iron supplementation. Iron status is problematic because when you look across the landscape of endurance athletes, iron deficiency affects anywhere from three to 11% of male athletes and 15 to 35% of female athletes. That is a lot of us out there. Iron status is impactful because good iron status and hematological values affect performance directly. So much so that in fact, many of you will remember last week, we spoke with Oliver Girard. And during that conversation, we spoke briefly about iron status being a gatekeeper of sorts for high altitude interventions. And finally, it's confusing as in using dietary interventions and supplements to course correct iron deficiency is often riddled with these very nuanced individual differences and responses to the supplementation protocol. So to help us out here on the podcast today is Dr. Alana McKay, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at Australian Catholic University. She has an immense amount of experience working in both a research setting, as well as directly with athletes underneath the fantastic Australian Institute for Sport. Her papers on iron metabolism and supplementation have piqued my interest over the years, and some of the protocols and framework developed through that research has informed the way that I work with athletes when navigating iron status and iron supplementation. You guys will find this conversation immediately impactful particularly if you're an athlete that is routinely or does suffer from some form of iron deficiency. As always, links to the various papers and resources are in the show notes. If you want to dive a whole lot deeper, they are all there. Okay, with that out of the way, I am getting right out of the way. Here we go. This is my conversation with Dr. Alana McKay, all about iron status and iron supplementation. So Alana, thanks for coming on the podcast. First and foremost, um, as we were talking off air, this is something that we could probably get quite technical with, but I think we're going to try to leave it as, as, as practical and high level, um, as, as possible. But before we get into, before we get anything proper, just so the audience can get to know you a little bit better. Can you just give a, like the audience just a brief background of your general area of study? And I'm going to preface this and embarrass you a little bit. Your career has been quite amazing. Like you're in the right place with the right people and the right mentors. And it shows because of the work that you have put out at this stage of your career. So with that as a backdrop, you can add into that as much <laughs> as you want to. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, as you mentioned, my name's Alana McKay. I have a PhD in sports science and sports nutrition. Um, you are completely right in that I was so lucky early in my career to have an opportunity at the Australian Institute of Sport where I met some fantastic people, um, David Pine and in particular Louise Burke, who I'm lucky enough to work with now today. Um, but I met these people and uh, started working in the field of elite sport and in sports nutrition and physiology. Um, and I then started my PhD while in conjunction with the Australian Institute of Sport. It was actually based out of the West Australian Institute of Sport. Um, and I met Pete Peeling, who at the time is and still is. He's the guru in iron metabolism and athletes. And he became my primary PhD supervisor and me and him get along like a house on fire still today, um, doing all things iron metabolism related research. Um, but even though once I finished my PhD, I've gone to the east coast of Australia and I do work at Australian Catholic University um, as Louise Burke's postdoc. Um, and I'm really lucky as much as I get to do my you know, primary area of interest really is the iron metabolism, but I get to do such cool stuff as part of this research group. We do a lot of work around carbohydrate metabolism, a lot of work around female athletes um, and other nutrition areas that whatever pops up and we're interested in, we kind of get the opportunity to jump at. So I've had a really broad range of um, exposure to different research topics, but iron metabolism um, and iron supplementation has really been my, my focus. Well, and I think some of that broad range of, of exposure, as you mentioned, it kind of comes through in your work because we're going to talk about something that is 
near and dear to your heart. And that comes out a lot in the research that you produce. And that's how iron metabolism gets affected by both exercise and diet. And a lot of times when I talk to um, a, lot, a lot of the research folks or even the practitioners, they kind of get siloed into one thing or another thing. And the exercise physiologists really don't know a lot about the biomechanists and the nutritionists don't know a lot about the exercise physiologists. And I always appreciate yeah. people who have a pedigree and an upbringing to where, yes, they might have their area of expertise, which you absolutely have, but they can also synthesize things from other areas as well to make them very practical. And that's, that's really where the synthesis comes through. It's, it's to, it's to make it very practical. And I've always appreciated that about what you guys do at the Australian Institute for sport. You really, you, you really leave athletes and coaches like myself feeling that whatever you produce, we can actually take into the field in some way, shape or form. We can take it to an athlete literally the next day to elect the next month, the next Olympic cycle and, and reap some practical value out of it. Yeah. Louise Burke's favorite saying is, um, you know, she can't do much with alphabet soup. So you see all the um, <laughs> really basic science. It's all these, you know, um, acronyms and enzymes and we call it the alphabet soup, but it's really about taking that and putting it and testing it in a, a way that can be implemented by athletes for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to see if we're going to, we can do that with iron metabolism. To start out with, I know, I know it's so, I always, I always, I, I've said this like five or six times on this podcast, at least this just year, I always hate asking people to give me the nickel version of what you have spent the better part of your adult life studying, but inevitably that's what we have to do because we've got to bring the audience to at least get them into the same book, maybe not the same page or the same paragraph, but at least the same book. Yeah. So let's kind of start there. And the orientation that, that, that I want to use here is somebody takes in a meal, right? They take in a steak and spinach salad. We have heme and non heme iron, uh, iron in that. They take in a meal. How does that iron eventually end up in a kind of a functional state in their body from, from kind of mouth to almost bloodstream? Yeah. So if we think um, about how the body regulates iron to begin with, the body can't produce iron. So that's one of the things that makes iron metabolism unique is that we can't actually make an iron in our body. We can only obtain it exogenously, which means we can only take it in from the diet or in through supplements. Um, there's no other way within the body to try and make up missing iron. So the first thing is we have to be consuming enough iron, hopefully and primarily through the diet, but if that's insufficient, through supplementation. Once it comes in through the diet or through the body, we see typically it's absorbed at the level of the gut. Um, there are lots of barriers to absorption and this is why iron absorption, um, iron status can be particularly challenging uh, because we do only absorb anywhere between two and maybe 35% of the iron that we eat. Um, we see higher absorption from, as you mentioned, heme iron sources, which are iron sources that come from animal products, thinking red meat, chicken, fish, um, those sort of products. Uh, we see less absorption occur from non-heme iron. So that's going to be things like uh, legumes from often high carbohydrate sources, beans, nuts, those type of foods. Um, we see a greater amount of our diet is made up of non-heme iron, and that's an important source of iron, but that's why optimal iron metabolism and absorption is going to include a mix of both heme and non-heme food sources. We know that when we'll probably get into this exercise adds an additional layer and challenge into absorbing that iron. But once we do get it through the gut, we see iron uh, sort of segmented off into different areas. Um, majority of it does go to the red blood cells. Um, so we see iron, if we think, I'm sure you've all heard of hemoglobin, it's part of the red blood cell, which makes us, um, our aerobic capacity is large and our VO2 max is large. Heme is iron. So the hemoglobin is the iron in the hemoglobin. So the majority of iron goes to hemoglobin, but there is also iron that goes into storage. Um, so if you've ever had a blood test and you've seen serum ferritin come up, ferritin is the storage protein. So there is a lot of iron that goes into storage as ferritin as well. And then we see other iron go and get stored in various components of our body, um, things like our spleen, our liver and other tissues, um, a little bit in our muscle as well. See, you could do it. 
<laughs> I mean, that was a good, no, no, seriously, that was a great overview. I would give any of our coaches who gave an overview like that of <laughs> how iron gets in the body, I would give them an A plus. So excellent, <laughs> ex, ex, excellent job there. Um, so a, as I mentioned from the onset of the podcast, we're going to talk about specifically how exercise and how diet can affect iron homeostasis. But before we go into that, we have to talk, we have to talk about this one critical role of hepcidin within the body as this mm-hmm. kind of master regulator of iron metabolism. Explain that to the audience. How does hepcidin affect iron metabolism? And especially within this unique, it's almost a negative feedback loop uh, type of process where uh, 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 that's going on. Yeah, so um, hepcidin is actually a relatively new hormone comparative to other hormones we've known about for a long time. We've really only known about hepcidin for about 20 years. And in the context of exercise, probably even less, maybe 15. Um, But what hepcidin does is it's a way of the body's regulating iron. So when um, the body senses us going into iron depletion or low iron stores, our baseline levels of hepcidin will start to decrease. And what that decrease does is it allows more iron to be absorbed and acts as a mechanism or a way of us increasing our total body iron stores. Now, the opposite occurs when we start to see our iron stores get too high. And this is not really as relevant to maybe exercising populations, but more to pathology and um, other sort of diseases. We see uh, iron getting quite high and iron's toxic. So hepcidin starts to increase as a way of blocking further iron absorption. Um, And so that hopefully then allows the iron levels to come back down to a a more normal level. So essentially hepcidin acts to block iron absorption. When hepcidin's high, iron absorption is going to be poor. And I think Uh, that's important to understand when we go through some of the pieces of your research and you'll, it'll just roll off of your tongue, hepcidin increased or hepcidin decreased. And what I'm trying to set in the listener's mind is what, how that actually affects iron absorption at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think the interesting part to think about how this hormone changes in response to exercise, which is sort of the fundamental around what about a lot of our work looks at, is that we see we do a bout of exercise and we see an inflammatory response. So in particular, IL-6 is this inflammatory cytokine that increases, um, and it's particularly responsive to long-duration exercise, which is probably very applicable to a lot of your audience. So the longer we exercise, the more increased in IL-6 we see. And then three to six hours following that increase in IL-6, we'll start to see this increase in hepcidin occur, which also the magnitude of the hepcidin increase will depend on the magnitude of the IL-6 increase. But as IL, as sorry, hepcidin starts to increase, we're going to see a decrease in iron absorption. So if you think practically you're doing a run in the morning, you've seen this peak in IL-6, and then you're starting to see this increase in hepcidin between, say, 11 and 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, it's during that time you're going to have impaired iron absorption. So you have to think of exercise promoting an increase in hepcidin, which causes a decrease in iron absorption. And there's not much we can do about that. It's a safety mechanism within the body so that we don't um, start taking on too much iron for toxicity reasons, but it does make maintaining iron status in athletes really challenging. So automatically, I can tell you what the audience is thinking right now, and I'm going to mention it only to earmark it because I want to come back. I want to come back to it at the end. I realize it wasn't on our outline, but I know that you know this area very well. Athletes are starting to think about timing supplementation. Whenever we start going through, okay, this happens, and three hours later, this you know this biochemical phenomenon goes on, and then six hours later, that biochemical phenomenon goes away. Immediately, what people turn to is is okay, how do I you know, how do I supplement or how do I replenish or whatever strategy that they're trying to trying to undertake effectively to kind of compensate for, uh, uh, for, for what's going on. So I want to earmark that. And the reason I want to earmark it is because there's a couple of other things that I want to go through that affect this whole, that affects, that affects this whole run of show with iron absorption. You already mentioned exercise volume, and you were right. That is the primary lens that our audience will look through. I, you know, I just mentioned when I got on the horn today, I'm here in Leadville, Colorado, doing a training camp with, uh, with one of my athletes and our training activity was 10 hours today. So that, that introduces, that introduces yeah. some sort of perturbation to the, to our entire system, not just with iron absorption, but it's not uncommon to have these super long training activities. 
what else, how else does the duration specifically of whatever exercise they're doing in, in this audience cases, it's going to be running. How else does that affect iron, either homeostasis or iron absorption? Yeah, I think, um, the, as I said, the biggest thing is around how big that IL-6 response gets from the exercise bout itself to how much of an increase we're going to see in hepcidin in the, in the subsequent hours after exercise, which is going to dictate how much iron absorption is either impaired. Um, when you say duration, it's one thing we know is that the duration of exercise seems to be the biggest predictor. And I'll put a little plug for anybody that wants to read a geeky science paper. Our PhD student, Nikita Fensham, has just put out a really good review where she took all the papers in the literature and she looked at what sort of exercise factors start to contribute to um, greater increases in hepcidin. And she really saw that, you know, you got to think of exercise duration and exercise intensity as linked. We can't run at 100% VO2 max for 10 hours. It doesn't work. But what she did see is that it was really the duration piece which causes the greatest increase in IL-6. And some of the mechanisms behind that is because we start to see a decrease in muscle glycogen content occur as we exercise for longer durations of time. Um, you can be a really good carbohydrate fueler and feeder, but if you're doing a 10-hour exercise session, I just don't know how you're going to get that much carbohydrate in to keep your stores as high as they are at the beginning of exercise. So as um, our glycogen stores start to become a little bit more depleted, the muscle senses it's low in fuel, and it will signal the liver to increase IL-6 as a way of increasing also glucose um, and trying to increase that glucose in the system. But because of that, it's also increasing IL-6 from the muscle and we're starting to see an increased IL-6 response, which is essentially a, um, like a trigger or a, a secondary reaction to low glucose availability or low fuel availability. So particularly when we're exercising in the long durations or in durations under low carbohydrate availability or low muscle glycogen content, we are going to see an increased IL-6 response, which means we're going to see that greater um, period of impaired iron absorption in the following hours. So I'm going to give you the perfect lead in to talk about another one of uh, another one of the critical papers that you wrote on this subject. And it has to do with, is it low energy availability generally or low carbohydrate availability specifically? Yeah, so we did um, do a paper really recently where we had a group of uh, endurance trained race walkers. So we used a two hour exercise bout at 75% VO2 max, which is, is quite a challenging exercise bout. You know, we're thinking sort of for these guys at four minute pace um, for two hours. And uh, what we saw was that in athletes where we restricted carbohydrate availability. So we had three groups, I should go back a step further. We had three groups. We had one group that had high carbohydrate, high energy. We had another group that had um, high energy, but low carbohydrate. So they had the same amount of total energy, but they were completely restricted to the carbohydrate to about 50 grams per day. And then we had a third group that had the same proportion of carbohydrate as the high energy, high carbohydrate group, but their total energy was taken about a third of the way down. So they're only consuming about a third of the energy of the other um, high energy group. And what we saw was that in athletes with, um, the keto group. So it was a ketogenic low carbohydrate diet that we used as a model for this study. Um, and we saw that after six days adherence to this diet, where we can assume that the glycogen stores have been adequately depleted, that they had the biggest perturbations to the hepcidin response compared to the other two groups. Um, the actually and low energy and the high energy group actually had a very similar response. There was a trend towards maybe some uh, lower, uh, sorry, higher hepcidin response in the low energy group compared to the high energy, but it wasn't significant. So we can assume that it's quite similar, but the group that had no carbohydrate, but high energy had the biggest hepcidin response compared to the other two groups, which would assume or would translate to greater periods of decreased iron absorption following training sessions. So that makes us think that it's not energy per se, it's probably carbohydrate that's the biggest factor. And we've seen this also not only in iron metabolism, but in other body systems, like we've just had a paper accepted looking at um, gut function and gut permeability. We've also had some papers looking at bone health and all these papers are trending towards the carbohydrate being the essential piece in this um, puzzle. The low energy group, the trend probably comes from just a natural reduction in carbohydrate as part of a reduction in energy. 
but it's a group that had the severe reduction in carbohydrate, which was seeing the biggest impairments to iron metabolism. Just as a quick programming note, uh, the longtime listeners of the podcast will remember one of your colleagues, Ida Hirka, who came on this podcast and talked about the, the her 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 bone study. And just to your point, yeah. what she found was is the low carbohydrate group, not necessarily low energy, had mm-hmm. uh, uh, ha- had their bone health essentially uh, uh, compromised at that point. Yeah, and this those studies were actually um, Ida's a longtime friend of mine. Those studies were linked together. Um, and what we saw was the same thing. We saw this um, uh, suggestion that there's impaired iron absorption in the low carbohydrate group, but not the low energy group. And because it was a short-term study, we didn't actually get to see the sort of long-term effect on iron status from that particular study. But um, you would assume that if over time you're having these reductions in the amount of iron you're able to absorb, that there is going to be an eventual effect on your iron status. And you did an interesting, um, like more of a chronological follow-up study uh, to the study that you just mentioned earlier, where you see an initial perturbation in hepcidin levels when people undergo a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Then what happens after they start refeeding? Mm. Yeah, so this study is we had um, we had a bigger group of athletes and they did a three-week study uh, three-week ketogenic diet. And then we tested them after the three weeks and used that as our baseline measure and said there are differences in the responses. Um, We then gave them uh, 24 hours of carbohydrate intake. um, And we also, I don't even think it was that much. It was probably even less. So we really was an acute dose of carbohydrate intake and looked to see what happened. And that increase in carbohydrate intake wasn't enough to restore the negative effect that had been seen on hepcidin levels. So it does appear that it, uh, you can't rescue this response immediately in like one feeding session. It really, you need to bring the glycogen levels back up. And we think it's sort of, if you think of the glycogen levels as a fuel tank, um, it really needs to be at full to see um, hepcidin maintained at its lowest possible level to allow iron absorption. If you go all the way into empty, um, like a ketogenic diet, you're gonna see really big perturbations And in this study, we sort of tried to just top it up acutely and see what happens in the very short term. And we weren't able to rescue that response. We were still seeing perturbations occurring. So it does appear that, and this isn't going to be practical in all scenarios because we train with low carbohydrate availability as part of a general program. It's not that we can say we're going to be at full all the time, but it's about knowing when you're full and when you're chronically empty or when you're maybe moderately in that chronically empty zone that you could be at greater risk of iron deficiency. What would you speculate would be the time frame to where you would see iron homeostasis or iron absorption kind of return return to normal after undergoing a low carbohydrate intervention? Yeah, I think probably um, two to three days is probably where you'd see the regulation aspect come back to a normal range. Um, that's sort of what maybe the literature suggests on a performance front, that that's how long it maybe takes to get carbohydrate back into the um back into the muscle, back into storage levels, and also have adequate circulating carbohydrate. Um, The effect that has been had on the iron status, so like the iron storage may take another week or so to really, it could take longer. I don't really know. Actually, I haven't really thought about that before. How long those, it depends on how long you've been on the diet for as to how much of a decrease you've had in your iron status to how much of a repletion you'd need to get back up without making major adjustments to the dietary iron um, that you're consuming, but certainly not one day, and probably not certainly as not long one as day. T- probably not as long as two weeks, right? I mean, if you wanted to yeah. put a, like a bread box number around it, yeah. And it's funny how adaptable the body is. You know, it's really it senses what's going on quite quickly and will adjust how it regulates the body based on um, the fueling status of the body at any time. But yeah, we can definitely say that 24 hours wasn't enough to rescue that response, but it is quite adaptable it will you know the the regulatory aspects of what's going on will change quite quickly based on the energy status of the body excellent okay i want to shift gears a little bit and and ask you to kind of put your practitioner's hat on a little bit you work with athletes and you give athletes advice all the time you don't just sit in a lab in a lab coat with test tubes and things like that like like i mentioned on the onset (laughs) you're a real person that works with real people um and this came to mind because i just recently recorded a podcast on live high, train low altitude interventions and some of the learning lessons that we've had over the past couple of decades of introducing those interventions to athletes. 
And, and, and one of those that is related to this topic just has to do with ferritin stores to where now many, if not most practitioners kind of have a card cutoff to where they want to see their athletes above whatever it is, 25 or 30, or, or 30, somewhere around there, those levels of ferritin before they would introduce an altitude intervention. And the, and the reason for that, this podcast hasn't been released as of the time that we've been recording it, but it will be released by the time people are listening to it. So if you listen to it, the real, the reason for that is because you just don't get the adaptation and you have a high likelihood of maladaptation. Um, yeah. And so I'm thinking about this in terms of what you mentioned from the onset is that volume is one of the key things that can alter the hepcidin response and iron absorption. So should we think about high volume interventions, just like what I'm doing right now with my athlete here in Leadville, should we think about high volume interventions in the same way that we think about live high, train low, or altitude interventions in preloading or making sure that there is some sort of cutoff almost within their iron levels in order to make sure that they're, that they're at least not maladapting in some way to the training load yeah that's a really interesting concept i haven't really thought about that before i will say based on what we know so we've done um three week training camps as in an intensified way so again with these race walkers you know not ultra endurance type distances but we are talking sort of 150k a week sort of on average and that's a quite a big increase from what they were doing before they came into the camp um coming off the summer break um, and what we saw was that iron status or ferritin, the iron storage molecule, declined by about um, 25 to 40% over that three-week period in these athletes. So it was that um, increase in load, which was predominantly done by longer sessions and more sessions, um, managed to have a really significant quick impact on iron stores because that you got to think of that storage iron, that iron gets mobilised to go to adaptation. So essentially you've got to think of it as the storage iron the iron moves from storage into the red blood cell to make you have a greater VO2 max. And that's very simplistic, but that's sort of what it's doing. Um, It's been mobilized to go to adaptive processes um, and the storage iron will decline. And that comes as a result as heavy training. Um, Heavy training interventions, I would be skeptical to say that um, you need to preload just because iron is toxic. We have to remember that if we give it in really high volumes and athletes that present with healthy iron status may may have conditions that cause them to take on iron really quickly so i would never say we need to supplement in people particularly that have a a ferritin over 50 but if somebody is undergoing heavy training and you're monitoring them and they're declining you can top them up during training and that's important that you are monitoring frequently enough that if you are implementing these interventions that you can keep on top of it Um, it's kind of hard unless you know your athlete and that's where it can be hard. Like when I consult with athletes, if I know them and I see what their iron status generally does in response to, you know, example A of a training camp, I can kind of gauge what they might need to do in future camps. And we know part of this is genetically related. Some of it can be due to conditions like hemochromatosis. We do see athletes with hemochromatosis, but because they train so much, they present with low ferritin. So if you start to load them, they may go over the top. So you don't want to maybe load them but definitely supplementing during heavy training camps, even if it's not at altitude, is not the worst idea. And it is something that we see quite frequently, particularly female athletes, because they are going to have additional challenges to iron metabolism. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you need to preload per se, like altitude training that we do. Um, but, and even the preload that we do for altitude, it only needs to be two or three weeks typically. Yeah. And sometimes people think it needs to be three months in advance, but two or three weeks typically is enough to get the storage up to where it needs to be. Um, and on the altitude note, we we just had a paper accepted. So we'll be out, I think, end of this year now. We actually took some isotopes up to altitude and we trained in Australia at altitude with a group of runners. And when I say isotopes, it's a way of tracking iron absorption. So I gave them a meal and I saw how much of that meal actually made it into the red blood cells and how much was absorbed. And when you're at altitude, your iron absorption increases by about 2.5 fold. So it's 250% more iron that's making it from the food you eat into your red blood cells. So when you're at altitude, you're so thirsty for iron because it's being utilized so quickly, you're actually absorbing so much more than you can anticipate. Um, And that's why 
you can very quickly go into a deficient state when you're at altitude and why you can also use it as a way to replenish your iron really quickly. That's not going to happen at sea level. Um, but, yeah, I don't think you need to preload, but maybe during training you may consider if you're going into heavy altitude, uh, heavy training blocks that you consider increasing your iron intake. Here, here's how, how I've always looked at it. If I see poor hematological values, we're tracking an athlete over long periods of time, I'll be gun shy on the intensified training period, whether it's mm -hmm. high volume, high intensity, whatever concoction of intensified you want to kind of throw at it. When, when I start yeah. to see, when I start to see that go like in the lower quartile or even below their, their like normal range, if we have two or three years of history with, with, a, with a particular athlete or whatever, I just get gun shy on introducing an intensified training period. And I just run right the training and then course correct the hematological variables. And then yeah. once those are course corrected, then we look at an intensified training period. That's, that's the way that I've always handle it because I don't want to like rob Peter to pay Paul. Right. I don't want to make sure I don't want to like pour on all this training load when they're not in the right, when, when they're kind of not in the right physiological state to adapt from, from that load. Yeah. And I think it's also probably quite different. Like I personally, I'm working with a, um, well, I have a athlete in my study who's an ultra marathoner who does loads that I have not worked with before and go, gosh, you know, <laughs> that's why you're low. It's, it's very, um, it's quite eye opening. It's but, hard. Typically, I, yeah, typically I work with Olympic um, distant events. So, um, you know, the maladaptation athletes have to, they're, you know, you're quite adaptable. So even if you do have lower iron status, you can still get on with training. If you're implementing these really long training runs and these really long um, training weeks in terms of kilometres, you don't want to sink your athlete into the ground. And that's the type of sessions that probably has the ability outside of um you know, just iron status alone to really put somebody into an overtrained state. If your iron's not there, that's one of the, you know, the building blocks. So, yeah, I can see if those sort of sessions, you do probably want to tailor off and not push that sort of load onto somebody that doesn't have the hematological and um, physiological parameters to help tolerate it. Well, yeah, you be playing with fire in terms of overtraining very quickly. Well, similarly, the first course correction I always apply is to reduce the training load. Because I know yeah. it works, yeah. especially with ultra marathon yeah. runners, where we have really high training loads. You just mentioned, you know, an athlete in your, in one of your studies that has a training load that I can I can envision what it is because I see them all the time. If mm -hmm. if the if the hematological values start to get out of whack, the very first course correction alongside the supplementation, which we're going to go over in a second, is just reduce the mm -hmm. training load, and that's remarkably effective. Yeah. Yeah, and I can I can imagine that being the case absolutely, um, and even when we see um, conditions like reds pop up in athletes, one of the first signs of reds is often low iron status. Whether it's because they're not eating enough food generally and iron generally, or it's that they over training and they're utilizing their iron quickly. Low ferritin is often a very simple and easy way to think. Okay, maybe we need to investigate reds in an athlete who's not adapting to training. So it's a very similar concept there. If they don't have the the building blocks and the infrastructure, they're not going to adapt. So just pull back the, yeah. the training load until they're there. It, yeah. It makes perfect sense. Okay. So since we've already, we've danced around this a little bit, I promised I was going to come back to it. We're going to talk about supplementation uh, to set the table. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to a, uh, an article that you were co-author on along with uh, uh, Peter Peeling, who you mentioned earlier and Mark Sim that's in the GSSI. The title of it is, is contemporary approaches to the identification and treatment of iron deficiency in athletes. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful resource. The infographic that you put in there to classify the stages, uh, um, to classify all of the, uh, all of the different stages of iron deficiency and iron deficiency with anemia, with anemia and without anemia was brilliant as well as the uh, way that you, uh, approach the blood monitoring piece of it. So I'll steer readers to that. It's a very easy read. It's short read. It'll probably yeah. take you 10 minutes, uh, but really, but really impactful. And for me to you, I've probably sent this out to 10 of my athletes just, oh, just because it's so, yeah, just because it's so, it, just because it's so impactful, but here's the thing, this is where I need help. So I'm going to come at it from a personal <laughs> point of view. Whenever I have to Whenever I have to to start to incorporate iron supplementation with athletes, 
I always feel like it's a crapshoot. It's a crapshoot in terms of the type of iron that they are going to react the best to. And I'm, and that's not just the iron absorption. That's also any sort of gastrointestinal issue, issues that they might have as well. The timing of it. And I feel that we've got a little bit better parameters on that based on some of the early conversations that we just had, but then also the dosing and not the timing of the dosing, but are we using an everyday frequency or every other day frequency? I feel that all, all of those, the people who are watching the YouTube version of this should, should people see that Alana is laughing and I'm going to bring it out for the people that are listening to the podcast. So it seems like you feel my pain, I guess is what yeah. I'm saying. So can you help? Can you help? Yes. Um, you're right because this, it's, um, where to start? So there is so many different approaches we can take. And it's almost like to understand the best practice, we need to test them against probably the standard of saying 100 milligrams of elemental iron every single day. But then against that, we want to test all these approaches to see what's best. But then even when we figure out what's best, it's probably not going to be best for every athlete because they're going to have their own individual variations on it. And it's um, we have studies yeah. undergoing at the moment where we're trying to start to keep answering questions, but it's going to take time to get there because there's so many permeations about what might be best and why. And also um, it takes time, like to figure that out, it takes, it takes time, time and yeah. that's valuable. That's what the athletes and myself get the most frustrated at is when we do these supplemental interventions, you've got to let it run. And you if let it, it works, run. if it works great, you got lucky. That's what I've always, that's what I've always <laughs> said. If it works, you got lucky. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. And it's not like just, you're totally out that time, but it still takes time. That's the frustrating piece of it. Time. Yeah. So I think if you think, um, you know, you're not going to get a response to an oral iron supplementation intervention, anything less than six weeks. Um, you really have to give it six weeks to see what it's doing. And even then I would say more like eight to 12 is probably what you want to let a certain regime run before you say yes or no to it. Um, ferritin is not going to change immediately in all people. Some people it might jump really quickly. Other people, it may be a long, slow process of oral iron supplementation over time to get you back to a point and you have to sustain it. So I would be not wanting to jump to any conclusions before that point in time. Um, maybe to go through some of the points you made, formulation, really interesting point, and um, there are a lot of them out there. Uh, ferrous salts is probably what we recommend the most, and I say it because they are cheap. I think sometimes people forget that um, supplementing with iron is something you may have to do multiple times, uh, not maybe not a day, but, you know, multiple times a week for weeks on end, you can't pick supplements that are not cost, I will are cost prohibitive. You need to pick a supplement probably that's affordable in your price range. You know, athletes aren't millionaires. So we need to try and test the supplements that are more affordable. Um, we do know some have sort of slow release capsules around them, which claim to be better. Um, and they claim to bypass some of the effects on the stomach and food untested in athletes. So it can't, it potentially is. And we do get anecdotal reports that people find it better on their stomachs in terms of symptoms because they bypass the gut and they release the iron slowly. But in terms of clinical trials and athletes or studies, we haven't got there yet. Um, and a lot of the studies or the formulations that claim in the literature, athletes or not, that claim to reduce gastrointestinal symptoms often just provide a lower amount of iron. So you might look at a, a paper or something and say it's a wonder iron supplement because it doesn't affect the gut that you look at it and it's only got eight milligrams of elemental iron. And no wonder the supplement I provided you is not is giving you symptoms because it has 100 milligrams of iron. There's a balance between finding a formulation that doesn't impact the gut but also provides you enough iron to have an effect on your iron status. You can supplement with a supplement that doesn't hurt your gut, but it's not going to do anything. So I'm not saying that you need to then push through symptoms. That's the last thing I'm saying, but it's understanding when you're looking at the formulations that you're considering an iron supplement that actually has some iron in it is probably the first thing to think about. Um, so salts are definitely the place I go to first. There are different types of capsulations in the salts. Um, in Australia, we have something called Multifer, which is looking quite promising. Um, and we have a trial testing it at the moment. Um, I'm not quite sure what the equivalent is in other parts of the world, but it does claim to reduce symptoms and we are going to look at that in athlete populations. Um, the next part of that is in terms of timing. Um, wait, 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 hold up. Before we go oh, sorry, on. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's keep, let's keep on the type. There's probably first. a lot. No, 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 yeah. let's keep on the type first. And I'm going to try to pin you down a little bit on this. 
Yeah. What's your go-to one? Like an athlete comes to you, you've got a reasonable history with them. You know, you need to supplement iron for one reason or another. Where, like, where would you, do you, or I guess the first question is, is do you have a common starting point? And if so, what it, like, what is that? Yeah. So there's probably the two there's, again, it's going to be very Australian focused here because of the brands, but sure. um, Ferrograd C, which is a, a um, ferrous sulfate supplement, 100 milligrams of elemental iron. I probably am reluctant to get for a sulfate. Yeah, so 100 milligrams of elemental iron. Don't look at the the type of iron. So, for instance, this supplement will actually have 400 milligrams of um, per sulfate in it, but 100 milligrams of elemental iron. Don't get tricked by the differences because that's when people think, oh, there's 100 milligrams. Like, no, there's actually six milligrams of elemental iron. So you want to look at the elemental iron, um, standard dose I like to start with is 100. Um, anything down to 60 I think is also okay, but I think 100 is nice and easy. Um, whether it's the ferrous sulfate or the ferrograd C or if it's the multifer with the encoded capsules, if they have a history of um, gut symptoms, I might just go straight to the fer- um, the multifer because they are similar in price point. And, again, that's my practical stance on it. It's just there are some that claim to do things, but they cost so much money and you can't yeah. put an athlete into debt over it. I would rather look at adjusting the protocol in other ways. Um, a hundred every day is sort of where I start. That's a lot. I say it's a lot. And there's also a difference between correcting a deficiency yeah. and topping up or maintaining your iron status. So if we're in a deficiency mode, hundred milligrams every day, and then check in after two days <laughs> because people will know straight away whether that's okay or that's not. I know people that pop iron pills like candy and it works and it's great. Um, and others that go, I've had one pill and that's enough for me. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, and we look at something different and very much maybe once or twice a week. Um, so it really depends on the severity of the um, deficiency where you want to start. I know in Australia, particularly we are, quite um, restrictive around IV iron supplementation options. So that's an intravenous iron. We're a bit around no needle policies where we can. So we do have athletes that come in quite iron deficient and we do want to start them on oral iron supplements to see if they're reactive first. That's pending that they don't have big competitions in any time soon and other things like that. We do prefer to start on oral iron even if they are with a ferritin under 20. So, yeah. Start aggressive and you'll figure out straight away whether they like it or not. It's really quickly they will figure it out. And then you can sort of start to tailor whether it's um, the frequency, whether it's the maybe the um, dosing that you're giving them. You can move down to 60. Finding a supplement between 60 and 100 is quite hard. They're either like um, clinically relevant 100 milligrams of elemental iron or they become more multivitamin style 20 milligrams of elemental yeah. iron and those I try to stay away from so I'd rather say 100 milligram dose every second or third day and see how that reacts um, before going down again okay l- l- but again re- so individual <laughs> yeah no that's that's why I hate to that's why I hate to like make the blanket yeah. recommendation but but here's what I take from that you're going with the with what it, in the U.S. if you walk into any supermarket Fair sulfate is going to be the most common iron supplement that yeah. you can find. It's usually yeah. the cheapest. And yeah. um, so I hope the listeners kind of like take that to heart because there are a lot of exotic iron uh, iron formulations out there. Some of which I have used with athletes quite successfully. Yeah. I'm not going to knock those. Yeah. But starting out with the basic one is not a bad way to go because you're hearing it from the expert over here, but you got to hammer it and then hammer it every other day or every third day. Do you want to elaborate yeah. on the both the timing and the frequency piece of it? Because you 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 did you did start to discuss that part as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of timing, I think the only thing I can say with real confidence is that morning is best. So we do think morning <laughs> is best. Um, but that being said, there's we've just put a trial out where we had a group of dancers who we said, all right, we want you to do best practice morning supplementation for oh, I think it was six to eight weeks. I can't quite remember the time frame. Morning supplementation. We had another group that went, you're going to do evening supplementation just to see what the difference is. In the end of the trial, the ferritin's doors were the same. They both increased to a certain amount. So as much as we know that the absorption is better in the morning and all these factors, when you overlay it in the complexities of lifestyles with different diets and food matrices, with different exercise sessions, in the end, the increase was very similar between morning and night. So 
I always say to athletes, go the morning. If you forget, go the night. It's probably going to do a very similar thing. But the best practice is morning supplementation. Um, I know, again, some athletes use night supplementation as a strategy to overcome the gastrointestinal symptoms associated with the supplements. So they sleep through the, the potentially unwarranted supplements. If that works, it works. So again, it's so individual about how you want to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But technically, based on absorption studies in athletes, we know that morning is best. We also know that there may be this niche time um, between pre and 30 minutes post-exercise where iron absorption may be enhanced because of the effects of exercise. So the original study that was done by Rachel McCormick a couple of years ago now showed that when you gave the iron supplement 30 minutes post a running bout, it was actually had greater absorption compared to when no running was done at all. So we think it's a bit like um, protein, where if you take your protein close to exercise finishing, you might get a bit of a bump on the effect of the protein. There may be this window. We've just done a study, again, it's about to be published, um, where we compared that 30-minute post-exercise window to 30 minutes pre-exercise, and we saw really similar results. So we think that somewhere between pre and immediately post-exercise is potentially like a golden window for getting that iron in. Again, only if that exercise bouts in the morning. Um, anywhere from sort of 90 minutes onwards post-exercise, you're starting to get the effect of that increase in hepcidin occurring. So anything from then onwards is actually going to have significantly um, impaired iron absorption. So we sort of think of it like a bit of a curve where you might get a bit of a spike immediately post-exercise and then it drops off dramatically and you will have very impaired absorption. So that's sort of like a new area of interest that we're sort of following up on about whether there's this sort of golden window of opportunity in the immediate post-exercise period. That's potentially something else to do with the timing. So would you, there's that piece of nugget. <laughs> would you use the same amount of iron in that case or are you potentially reducing it because of the enhanced absorption? I probably would use the same amount because it, we're talking, when we look at the absorption changes, they are quite small but it's about getting all the bang for your buck that you can. Um, so I probably would use the same amount. We're not talking about you actually taking on an extra one or two grams of iron. We're talking quite minuscule shifts realistically, um, but that's where the, the evidence is currently pointing morning, either pre or immediately post exercise. And even then I would say if it's a very prolonged exercise bout, like some of your listeners would be um, inclined to complete, I would say go pre-exercise because, again, there's a time course element to all of this based on the exercise session itself. And we typically don't um, perform studies just because it's quite hard to recruit studies for exercise bouts more than two hours. So I would say stick with pre-exercise supplementation in that case. Okay. The last element to this, every day, every other day, every third day. <laughs> yeah. Um, what we know is that the more iron you take on, the less – there'll be a decrease in the fractional absorption. So if I'm taking on 100 milligrams of iron, I may absorb 20% of that, which is 20 milligrams. If I take on 50 milligrams of iron, I may only absorb 17% of that. Sorry, I will absorb maybe 25% of that, which is 25 grams of iron. So there's a difference between the absolute absorption and the um, relative absorption that changes over time. And that probably wasn't the best example because now I've realized my math doesn't add up. <laughs> Essentially, let me start again. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're taking on more iron, you're going to have a lower fractional absorption, but you're probably going to have more absolute absorption. Um, so if I can do my math correctly, if we think of a 50 milligram dose, you might absorb 25 milligrams of that i uh, sorry 25 oh, okay i'm gonna give up on math because i'm too hard i can't <laughs> see it today. Right. But, the audience is used to me screwing up the math so oh my me. gosh we're in the, we're in the normally same have these figures in front of me but we're not there <laughs> so the more iron you take you will have a reduction in fractional absorption but you will take on more absolute iron so yep. the more iron you, in, you consume the more iron you're probably going to um, uh, absorb there are caveats in that the more iron you consume, the more gastrointestinal symptoms you are going to have. That's sort of where we know there's a dose response relationship. Um, we have done studies with athletes where we looked at every day versus every alternate day. Um, that was a six week study, again, led by Rachel McCormick from our group. She saw that um, the alternate day actually took um, way less iron, so probably half the amount of iron that the every day took. And there was a similar increase in the iron stores after that. 
So it does appear that alternate day dosing is just as effective as everyday dosing. And even some of the more um, absorption-based mechanistic studies do support that theory as well. There's really good evidence to say that is a, a appropriate theory that may enhance iron absorption. We see sort of similar results. I'm not sure we have the evidence to say every third day yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are similar results. Mm. I think um, we do know if you take a supplement, again, thinking of hepcidin's response, you're going to see a big peak in hepcidin because thinking, oh, no, there's too much iron in the system because it's a bulbous, and then um, that lasts for about 24 hours. So if you're taking another supplement while hepcidin is still elevated, the second supplement you're going to consume less, uh, absorb less of. So if you're waiting three days before your next supplement, and particularly if you, I say this sounds terrible, if your body's a bit thirsty, if it's a bit iron depleted and it's really wanting some iron in the diet, it's probably going to absorb a lot of more of the iron on the third day dose um, because hepcidin's low and the body is sensing that it wants some iron. Um, so third day supplementation regimes are really good, particularly for athletes that maybe want, um, they suffer with gastrointestinal distress. That is one of the biggest things that, I think when it comes to athletes, it's about finding formulations and pro dosing protocols and times a day that suit supplements and not so much um, absorption. And when we, from a scientist's perspective, all I want to do is figure out what is the dose that's going to be the most optimal for absorption. But when it comes to putting a practitioner hat on, it's really about figuring out a dose that's actually going to be tolerated by the athlete and is enough to increase their iron status. So there's two sort of conflicting ways to look at it. Um, I always say more iron is more iron. So if you're deficient, every day with a hard dose is probably where you should start. But that's not going to be tolerated by a lot of athletes. So it's then about finding where the balance is between that, between every day 100 milligrams of elemental iron and nothing at all. <laughs> it's finding the sliding scale that's going to suit each individual athlete. Well, and some athletes will actually choose to throw the, kind of literally, now that I'm thinking about this term, throw the kitchen sink at it. They're going to do supplementation. Yeah. They're going to really focus on their diet. They're going to cook in an iron skillet. They're going to try, they're, they're basically doing kind of everything they can because they realize and they've heard stories or maybe have experienced that it is tricky and it even yeah. changes over time. Like even I've had athletes on one type of iron supplementation that worked great. And then three or four years later, for whatever reason, the exact same supplement, exact same dose, exact same frequency, exact same conditions for whatever reason, isn't kind of moving the needle. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad I have some, uh, some company in this misery of trying to, of trying to figure this out with athletes. At least you can, you know, we can both partake in how tricky it is. Yeah. And I think it's also worth noting that you don't need to when you have an athlete that just can't tolerate supplements, you don't need to push through that. There are other options, yeah. IV iron infusions. And most practitioners in Australia, they want you to start with oral supplements because, again, they're low risk and easy and quite cheap. But if you can't tolerate them, a practitioner will absolutely give you an iron infusion if you're iron deficient. And that's an easy way to – the iron bypasses the gut, so there's no symptoms associated from that point of view. There are some risks, but – um, they are quite minor these days, given the advancements in the formulation. So I would say as much as oral iron supplementation is an easy way to get the iron stores where they need to be, and particularly before things like altitude, to have a couple of weeks of supplementation before and during altitude, it's a really easy way to keep the iron stores in check. You don't need to suffer if you're actually <laughs> suffering. There are other options to bypass the gut, and you can think of other ways to do that. So I'd be remiss not to mention, since we're talking about supplements, if you are, uh, if you are subject to doping control, make sure your supplements are NSF certified. Uh, cause there's a lot of them out there that probably don't contain what is actually in them. Yeah. And particularly I, my red flag sometimes when somebody asks me about the doping control side of things is if it contains only iron and maybe vitamin C, vitamin C does enhance iron absorption. So vitamin C can be one of the ones that iron is with you're probably okay. Check it, but you're probably okay. If it contains anything else, if there's magnesium or zinc or anything else, it becomes a multivitamin and they're the ones that you really do need to check. hundred percent. Alana, this has been awesome. I learned a lot and I also had some of my own practices. I finally had a little bit of justification for it. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate you coming on, but as I mentioned on the onset of the podcast, I, I appreciate your work. Uh, we are in debt to you as practitioners, as coaches and the athletes listening to this for people like you that put out such uh, amazing, uh, such amazing works. 
I'm going to leave links in the show notes to everything that we talked about. You could probably go through it all in about 30 or 45 minutes and you would be much better informed than you were at the beginning of that. It is well worth your time to go through these articles. Is there anything that you would like to leave the listeners with though? Where can they get a hold of you or find out more about you and your research? Yeah, I think um, just to follow up on some of those points, firstly, I am very lucky that I have an amazing team of people that I work with, so I cannot take credit alone for even half of what I do. It is very much a team effort with our group. Um, the second one was, you're right, there is the um, GSSI resource. We actually wrote a big um, sort of very full scientific paper in sports med, but the resource that um, GSSI or the Gatorade Sports Science Institute has put on their website is definitely aimed at um, athletes and it is simplified information so I definitely think if you want somewhere to start that's a great piece that's um, really for that target audience it's not written super scientifically so it's quite a good piece um, and then so the last bit is I'm on Twitter and that's probably the best place to find me um, at McKay Alana um, I'm pretty responsive if you want to drop a message about anything so that's probably the best place to find me Awesome. Well, keep doing what you're doing. I, like I said, from the onset, I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope the listeners came away more informed from this podcast. Wonderful. Thanks for your time. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. As I mentioned from the onset of this podcast, I absolutely love Alana's work. And if you want to start with anything, start with that GSSI paper that we mentioned. It's linked up in the show notes. It's a great resource, easy to read, and there's a fantastic infographic that will help you navigate this area very quickly and very effectively, even if you have no previous exposure to it. I got to tell you guys that I have appreciated all the love I get with this podcast since I introduced it several years ago. I'm kind of losing track at how many podcasts I've actually done now. And as I've mentioned several times before, I run this podcast without sponsors or advertisers of any kind, and that is to keep the information as clean and as uncluttered as possible. If you wanna support this podcast and inform your ultra training all at the same time, you can go and check out my new newsletter, Research Essentials for Ultra Running. Every single month, our team critically reviews three papers that are relevant to the ultra marathon space, and we break them down in an unbiased and unfiltered way. We badger the methods, the statistics, and ultimately use everyday language to communicate the key takeaways. Related to this topic, all the way back in issue two, we review a paper on how ultra marathons specifically affect iron metabolism. You can get access to all the past and the current issues for just $9.99 a month, or a hundred bucks for the whole year. It's a product that I am very proud of and I believe stands out in the content marketplace today, which is full of clickbait headlines and half-baked takes, and this is not one of those. So I hope you guys go and check that out. Okay, as a little bit of a tease coming up on the podcast in the next few weeks, we are gonna have a great one on mitochondrial development and interventions that you can potentially use to amplify the training response with David Bishop. We've got a great guest lined up to discuss the current state of exogenous ketones. I know y'all will want to stay tuned for that one. And I'm getting back on the mic finally again with an old school podcast guest, one of the first guests that I've had and somebody that I've actually had on my audio book, the legend Guillaume Mie, who set much of the training framework for what we use today in training athletes for ultra running. He was one of the very first people that I came across when I was trying to figure out this problem how, of how we coach various ultra runners. That is a conversation that I'm very much looking forward to as he has had a tremendous impact about on how I think about coaching ultra runners. All right, that is enough of the tease for the next few weeks. That is all, and as always, we will see you out on the trails.